Deep Tech, a world operating at the edge of technological innovation. Powered by singular breakthroughs in science and engineering. Today, Deep Tech is perhaps more critical than ever. As we experience an extraordinary pace and scale of technology advancement. The opportunities for new tech-enabled solutions have never been greater. The need has never been greater either. Tech Surge, a platform for insights and connections at the intersection of global entrepreneurial discovery, technology, and capital markets. Bringing together business, investment, and academic leaders to share, learn, and build as we move the deep tech sector forward within this important and unique window of challenges and potential. Building upon yesterday. Catalyzing today. Defining tomorrow. Welcome to Tech Search, the global deep tech summit. There's probably no other period in history where we've had as much scale and speed as we see in today. And on top of that, there's probably never been a period when the demand for new technology innovation has been greater. I like the entrepreneurs today. I'm hoping they don't get bad. You know, I think they're more cognizant of a lot of things, including their impact of what they make. I think they really are. They are cognizant and a little slower, right? A little bit slower in developing. They're not in a mad rush for share or anything like that. So I find many of the younger ones I meet, especially around climate change tech, health tech, uh, some of the EV stuff, it's hard, right? It costs a lot of money, like that kind of stuff. And so I find them to be more thoughtful, um, a little bit more cognizant of where it's going, like the impact. I think that's one of the things you saw problematically at some of these other companies where they just didn't think. They just ran right into the breach and filled some need and didn't think of the impact. I think they're much more mission driven in a weird way. I think some of the, I, I'm spending a lot of time with EV people and climate change tech people and I find them really, they're solving real problems. I've never seen a technology move as fast as the deep neural network learning, machine learning technologies are moving now. Never. Never. And that's remarkable because I remember the days of the internet and the internet moved really fast, I thought. And the VLSI revolution happened really fast. But this AI revolution, as somebody pointed out, it's the only thing that's moving faster than Moore's law. <laughs> the journey that Indian ecosystem has had over the last 20, 30 years, uh, it presents sort of a very interesting opportunity for the US to look at the Indian market in a slightly different way. Is India an interesting place for deep tech? Is India capable of really addressing the supply chain constraints that we have? India had done rather well in terms of helping small and medium firms in getting electricity, getting credit, getting construction permits, and protecting minority investors. Done incredibly well in all three of these things. Now, if India does well in attracting investment, this could be India's time. But again, it depends on what India does. Over the next decade, uh, I see this growing in an exponential manner. Uh, in India, nothing, nothing goes in a linear manner. Right? I mean, we, we skip sort of a couple of stages and it's always exponential in growth. And that is, at least in my opinion, that's what's going to happen to the whole deep tech ecosystem as well. In 10 years, uh, people believe India will be a 10 trillion economy. So India, with all its tailwind, is an enormous opportunity for deep tech investments. I think this is going to be the most exciting decade in technology by a factor two or three fold that we've seen. If I were placing bets big time today, which I am, I would have bet on AI, and I would have bet three or four or five years ago uh, on AI. I would be focused on cybersecurity. It's unfortunately going to be a key element as we move forward. Uh, I would think very much about how companies truly go digital and the implications on that. Great time to be bullish, and yes. We can only learn from the past and it's okay to make mistakes, learn from them and let's make new mistakes now. It's a great time to be an entrepreneur, great time to build tech companies. Just put your head down, make sure the problems you pick are big enough and they're a painkiller for somebody. They're not vitamins. It's not the strongest of the 
species which survive, but the ones which are most agile. And I think you, you referred to that both, right? So I think as, as you look at VCs and startups, how post-pandemic to the new normal will you be more agile and how will you adapt, right? So that's the key for us to look at companies like that. So I think uh, what everybody recognizes is that semiconductors absolutely form the backbone of everything that is shaping the world today, from data centers to your PCs to smartphones to industrial 4.0, smart factories, autonomous cars, IoT, everything is powered by uh, semiconductors. Whether you're deploying capital or you're in operating roles, you have a tremendous amount to offer the economic strategy that we're trying to put into place. Because when you think about the bipartisan infrastructure law, when you think about the CHIPS Act, when you think about the Inflation Reduction Act, the success of all those will be dependent on what the private sector does with those incentives, how much investment there is, whether the workforce is prepared. And there's a lot of connections that need to be made through public and private partnership. And so if you're someone who's thinking about ways to deploy your skills in these industries that haven't always been in the spotlight, haven't always been in the State of the Union, this is a great time for folks from the private sector to engage. We have an obligation to solve this power efficiency problem. And I think it's a system-wide issue. It's not just the IP that ARM creates, but it's the memory from Sanjay. It's the system design. Uh, it's everything associated with it. I think in the State of the Union speech, there was a comment that we, we might need oil for another 10 years, for example. I think the industry needs to get more ambitious and aggressive. Um, when you think about states like California wanting to go full EV in the next 15, 20 years, the, the power grid's not going to be able to support that. <laughs> which basically means that the automobiles need to be much more efficient in terms of the computers that are inside them and the batteries that are there. And I, and I think it's a, it's a big issue around sustainability. And I think it can't be solved by one company. It's an ecosystem problem. But I think the industry needs to take it very seriously. And back to the comment that how ubiquitous our products are and everything that um, we uh, work and live, it's upon us as an industry to solve it. You had infrastructure as a service, then platform as a service, and now as you move up the stack, you have serverless. And that really helps to abstract away all of the complication of the infrastructure as a service so that developers can build applications very quickly without having to know exactly what's underlying all of the infrastructure, even the platform. And that's a really big enabler for the market. In the future, is about data and sophisticated compute that have to come together and so uh, for us that's, that's the next frontier as we continue automating more and more. The fact that you can use computers to do things that you couldn't do yourself, like how about searching the entire World Wide Web? You can't do that, I can't do that, but our computers can. And so using these things to empower ourselves to do stuff that we couldn't otherwise do for me is super exciting and of course just watching to see what the next opportunities are. Bioconvergence is really bringing together what we know in biological sciences with some powerful tools that we've developed recently. And there is so much data and information that really underlies life, you know, how we function, how we even breathe. So what's happening now is that for the really the first time you see a coming together, I would say probably the it's the chat GPT of our world. And it is solved one of the great problems of physics, chemistry, and biology all at the same time with AI. And I think this is still the tip of the iceberg. So it's still very early days for AI. Um, a lot of um, fear and resistance across the organization has dissolved because of ChatGPT3. So now we can bring change, but the next 10 years, 15 years, is still more tectonic changes ahead for us in terms of AI. So those are the two things that excite me. One is, the rise of open source models, which means that it will fundamentally democratize our ability to use these foundation models in all kinds of organizations, and two, the ability to handle much, much larger problems and a much, much larger data so that we can uh, build these models that are fundamentally more accurate and more capable. So sometimes people will ask me, like, what do you think are the use cases for AI? And I think, like, what are not the use cases for AI eventually? <laughs> um, I think it ultimately becomes a question around how do we prioritize and sequence? What do we go after first? Yeah. Where is the size of the price?